guest today, Drumbo, Mr. John French. In 1966, aged only 17, drummer John French joined Captain Beefheart and his magic band. One year later, he was playing on their seminal debut Safe as Milk, featuring a certain Rai Kuda Rom guitar, a record that John Lennon would declare as one of his favorites. By the end of the decade he had played on one aborted album, Mirror Man, their sophomore effort, Strictly Personal, and finally the groundbreaking, jaw-dropping, potentially violence-provoking, bona fide work of art, Trout Mask Replica. Along the way he, would also be screamed at, beaten up, drugged, ridiculed, humiliated, arrested, starved, stolen from, and thrown down a half flight of stairs by his employer, the captain, Don Van Vliet. Despite having transcribed every note of Don's ramblings on the piano and arranged them into playable pieces, and taught them to the other band members over the course of nine months, French would leave the band, head first down the stairs, and go uncredited, and unpaid on the finished album. He would return to the Magic Band another three times over the course of Beefheart's career for Lick My Decals Off Baby, The Spotlight Kid, Doc at the Radar Station and Bat Chain Puller. Beefheart gave him the nickname Drumbo. French grew up in Lancaster, California, the same area of Southern California as Frank Zappa, Don Van Vliet and other members of the Magic Band and the Mothers of Invention. His distinctive drumming style molded the driving heavy psychedelic blues of Strictly Personal and Mirror Man. In 2010 French released his memoir of his time in the Magic Band. So it is with great pleasure that we introduce John French to you. But first this tune from John's album City of Refuge.
Oh, um, could, I'd like to introduce everybody to John French. Now, before we get started, I have to do something, okay? All right. Here we go. La, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday from Sesame Street. Happy birthday to you. Okay, happy birthday, Mr. French. Oh, thank you. Who was that singing? <laughs> that was the guys from Sesame Street, actually. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it was a little corny stuff, but hey, it's your birthday, right? It is my birthday, yeah. Yeah, well, happy 72. birthday. 72. I'm 72 today. Okay, cool. And um, you're still putting out some great music, and, and we expect to hear more and more great music from you over the next coming decades. And... Um, I understand you just finished an album. Um, actually, I'm just working on a, a live show. I'm finishing mixing a live show. Okay, great. Um, I, on our final uh, tour, the Magic Band, I did a farewell tour in 2017. Right. And um, I wanted to do something special, and I'd already been down in uh, Austin doing a show okay. where I actually, you know... Uh, wrote some uh, horn arrangements for four horns and had three singers, three backup singers. And it came off pretty well, so I thought, well, I'll try it in Liverpool because I knew we were playing it. It was a special beef art weekend there. Right. And so we had, <clears throat> we didn't really have a chance to rehearse, but uh, this one girl that I, that I had met there before, I should say woman because she's a professor, Right. At the, uh, she was a professor at the local university, a very intelligent woman who also gave music tours. She knew a lot of musicians, so she put together the horn section and the singers for me. And uh, <clears throat> it was recorded. A friend of mine financed the recording of it. And so I've been working on that. We didn't have a chance to rehearse, so it was sort of like somebody dropping three jigsaw puzzles in the same box when I got, yeah. when I got the files and started going through them. Okay. So it was a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of work, but I I took it as a challenge to uh to uh you know do like a Frank Zappa kind of approach where I made it a studio enhanced album where sure. I redid a lot of vocals and stuff like that. You know? Okay. So that that was uh that took up most of uh the lockdown Sure. Uh, the last six months, I've been working on that pretty regularly. Okay. Well, let's um, get back to uh, I don't know, let's get let's get everything in in um, pretty much order. Um, you're living in Lancaster, and that's pretty much where your story started, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 And um, so you're back there now. And um, do you want to tell us how you got involved in uh, music, especially drums? Yeah, I, actually, I uh, I had a crush on this girl when I was a kid, and her mother invited, I, I think it was about 14, 13 maybe, and uh, her mother invited me to go to the drive-in with them. So we watched uh, an Elvis Presley movie. Okay. I think it was Kid Galahad, if I remember. And at the very beginning of the movie, you know, he's, he's hitching a ride in the back of a, a big 18-wheeler, and he's singing the song "I'm the King of the Whole Wide World," and he's tapping on his uh, on his legs, you know, kind of sort of slapping the rhythm on his legs while he's driving along, riding along. And uh, so I started doing that. I just kind of got into a habit of doing that. And uh, I real I started listening to music and realizing what the drum parts, you know, the different drums were. And started working on patterns. I kind of learned how to play by doing that. Okay. And um, some of your patterns are uh, classic. Um, that they've never they were never heard before. They were just pretty much um, um, new to everybody who heard them. Especially when you you know in the Magic Band, the original Magic Band, um, which that band was really based on um, on rhythms. It was more rhythm more more rhythmic than anything else. Is that you know? Is that safe to say? Yeah, I'd say so. 
Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, um, I I remember when I first do- joined the band, Don was uh, talking about different rhythms and stuff one night, and he said, uh, you know, it'd really be cool if you could play the delta rhythm with your right hand, and on the tom tom you could play this rhythm. And with the bass drum playing that rhythm, so, and that got me, that got me thinking about it, you know, in the beginning. But we were we were sort of, you know, I didn't really have a chance to practice on my drums much during the period when I was first in the band because right. I didn't have a car, so I could only practice at his mother's house where we had all our equipment set up in her living room. Sure. I. You know, my condolences to her because she had to come home from work every day with us <laughs> practicing. Yeah, I, I understand he was kind of rough to his mother too. Is that correct? That he, he kind of yeah, uh, he was. Yeah, he was very, uh, very disrespectful. Yeah, belligerent. Belligerent, maybe the word. That he, yeah, I understand he was pretty uh, awful to her. And uh, and yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, he, he was quite verbally abusive. In fact, one night I saw him get physically abusive with her. Ooh. He was actually choking her. Oh wow. <laughs> And I was thinking I'm going to have to step in, and he let go. And it's about the time I thought, you know, I'm yeah. going to have to do something here. You wow, know? wow, wow! I'd never seen any kind of I, I'd never seen any kind of behavior like that. I, uh, you know, uh, a child with their patient uh, with right. with their um, with their parent before. Wow, yeah, and um, that was just pretty much patterned through life. He was a, he, he thought he was a tough guy, huh? You know, you actually played in a club I was managing way back when. I used to manage a club called My Father's Place in Rosalind, Long Island. And, okay. Uh, and there's actually an album out from there. It's, uh, you know. I, I may not have been in the band because I was in and out of the band. I don't oh, recall. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have to figure out what year it was. But, um, yeah, so anyway, you were in the uh, band during its um, musical uh, uh, pretty much... Um, Heyday, you were on all the great albums. You, you know, you, 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 you were more um, involved in anything. Most of them. Yeah, I wasn't on Clear Spot, which I consider one of his greatest. Yeah, you. I mean, you weren't safe as milk. You were on a strictly personal. You were Trout Mask. Look, my decals off. Mirror Man. You know, just yeah. you know, Spotlight. Um, you know, uh, uh, Bat Chain Puller, right. which is great. Bat Chain Puller is all you. That's a, that's a great, great um, album for uh, anybody who's really into drums and percussion. It's an, a brilliant album, Radar Station. And, you, you know, um, Crow Fins was the um, was a collection of material, right, from the, uh, older, from the older days. Right, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That was uh, unreleased material. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you roll over that, too. So um, you were there for the, for the heyday. And also, um, you know, we had a little discussion yesterday there was always a, a matchup. It was always um, kind of like the Mothers of Invention versus the Magic Band, kind of like the Beatles and the Stones. You know, it was that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, right. But you you really weren't that involved with the Mothers until later on. Is that correct? Right. Really, not at all. I mean, we hardly ever connected with them. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I think the the two times I hung out with them was one time in the uh, Tom Mix log cabin. Uh-huh. When uh, right after Frank came back from the Garrick Theater in 1968, okay, he uh, rented the log cabin for a while. Yeah, Laurel Canyon, which was kind of a party house. It was known as a party house, right? And so a lot of people showed up there that, that were kind of undesirable. For you know, it sort yeah. of interrupted Frank's routine. So he he moved quite. 
quite soon after that. Right, right, right. But uh, you know, I got I was over there a couple of times. Got to hang out with uh, Jim Sherwood mostly. Oh, okay, I, yeah. I really like Jimmy. He was a great guy. Yeah, you know? yeah, and um, I know um, I, I spoke to Ian Underwood and uh, Bunk Gardner and Don Preston, and they all have um, right. They always have great, great. Um, uh, they have respect for your drumming. They they thought you were incredible, and um, they were always oh, sorry. Well, that's, yeah, that's they, kind. And they were always sorry that you never became like the second drummer in the Mothers, the way that Art Tripp did. You know, uh, Billy Mundy when they when they had that two drum thing going on, they said they would have loved uh-huh. to have had you sitting, you know, you know, on one of the thrones back there because, um, you know, your, your playing was always incredible and you did so much for the captain. Um, huh. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard of that. I've never heard that before. That what a great thing to say. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really had to uh, have a lot of respect to you, and um, I mean, this, they want to do something. Give them a call. I'll hook you guys up. I mean, they, they would be beautiful having a, uh, a Mother's beef heart thing because I know they're looking for a drummer. But um, we could talk about huh. that. Yeah. Well, we, I'm not. I'm not really. Uh, I I don't think I'm going to be touring anymore. Yeah, but, they uh, they don't know either, but maybe do some recording. Yeah, yeah. I did get to spend some time with those guys in uh, Australia, and I'm uh-huh. trying to think of the year. I think I think it was 2013. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, right around there. Because don't know. forget, they're 87 and 88 now. <laughs> I know. So, yeah, so they I don't... called up. Uh, I called up Monk and wished him a happy birthday on his birthday. Oh, did you? I said, it's John French. He goes, oh, my God! Yeah, you know? yeah. What a sweet. Isn't he a sweetheart? He is. Yeah, yeah. He really is. Don's a little grumpier, but he's a great guy, too. <laughs> yeah, Don, Don is uh, He's more of an eccentric uh, yeah, than yeah. Monk. Yeah, he Monk is. Monk is more outgoing. But I sat with Don at uh, Zappanow uh, in a restaurant when we were both playing for Zappanow. Uh-huh. And uh, he's a quite an interesting conversationalist. He'll he'll come up with all kinds of different topics. To talk I know. About. I know. We spent yeah, interesting we, guy. We spent one night um, on on the radio live doing a, a thing on a politics. He was all revved up, you know, ready to go. He was just really pissed off that day, and he had to get it off his chest. And then I spoke to Don a couple of days later, and Don was telling me that they were meeting to play, meeting up to play tennis. Now, and he said that, you know, Bunk doesn't like playing tennis with him anymore because he just had some tennis lessons and Bunk doesn't like to lose. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> they, they're like an old married couple. It was the funniest thing in the world. It was like I, I busted out left. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, they've known each other for, what, 60 years? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, a long time. So um, you have a reputation out there of being um, pretty much uh, recluse. You don't like to... Um, Get out there much and talk, and um, I, uh, no, not really, because you know I read back transcriptions of things that I've said, uh-huh. and, and I I look at it and I think that wasn't the word I meant to use at all. Right, and, right, right. So I I I am a better writer than I am a speaker. Okay, I really stumble over words, and I can go back. You know, when I write something, I could go back and make it concise. Right. And that's that's sort of my personality. I, yeah. I'm sort of a craftsman. You know, well, yeah, I, I'm forgetting a lot of words as I get older too. I, I, for, I, I keep kind of like getting little blackouts. Like, what did I really mean to say? And I guess um, it's kind of acceptable once you get to a certain uh, point in your life. So um, you were the um, driving force behind, behind, you know, behind the Magic Band. You kind of kept it going. You kept that uh, beat going. You kept the the, the whole flow going. And um, what what was your um, what, you know what was your end game? What did you want to see the Magic Band kind of evolve into? Well, uh, you're talking about. I'm talking about the old days band. when the captain was still around. I mean, even when he was around, oh, you kind of had oh, that. Okay. The band was yours, pretty much, right? Well, no, not really. It well, was. Uh, yeah, you were like there was a series of people when I when I joined the band. It was uh, Alex Snoffer was sort of the guy in charge, and then Don kind of took over, and then during the Troutmas period, I took over, and then after that, it was Zuder and Rolo. Yeah, you know, Bill Harker wrote, and uh, you know, Bruce Fowler had 
had a lot to do with the input, I think, during Shiny Beast time. So it was a lot of different people. And I, I didn't really have an end game, you know, or a vision of an end game. I was just trying to uh, make some sense of what Don was trying to do. Right. And, and, and get it so that we could go from A to Z in uh-huh. the studio. Okay. With, and know how to start and end the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, um, yeah, so you pretty much um, kept the band in tune. You know, you kept them, you know, you kept them ready to play. Sometimes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, during yeah. the trial mass time and during, I, I guess the best the best times, uh, the most uh, influence that I had was during trial mass replica yep. and also during um, uh, decals. the Bat Chain Puller. Okay. Album. No, I didn't have that much to do. That, that was Bill. Bill had taken over because I had left the band for a while. I was oh. gone for a year. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um... You got to work with Zappa, though, as a producer, right? I mean, you know, he produced your album. Uh, yeah. He produced Trial Mass Replica, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How was that? What was it like, like working with him? Well, he was pretty passive. I mean, he just kind of sat in the booth, and uh, uh, the the engineer, Dick Kunk, yeah. was uh, sort of, you know, an amusing guy, and, you know, he'd say, she's too much for my or anybody's mirror, you know, things uh-huh. like that. He'd joke around and, and kind of kept it lighthearted, but Frank was mostly quiet. He just, uh, and later on in an interview, Frank said that I, he said, I want to just keep my mouth shut and let Don do what he did. Right. You yeah. know, and, not, and not try to guide him or direct him or produce. He did, he did change one of the uh, lyrics. He asked him, there was a song called, um, my business is the truth. Your business is lie. Oh, okay. And Frank said, uh, you know, why don't you why don't you recite the the old part of play over this? Oh wow! So that that became that song because of that. Oh okay. And I remember. And, um, and he and he put some of his music behind the blimp. Uh-huh. You know that was Frank Zappa's. Uh, that was the Mother's playing. Right. But up but up but but Yeah yeah yeah. So uh, you know Frank. But he kept his input very, and it must have been hard for him to do because, you know, Frank is a guy who likes to control things, yes. And to give up that control, I thought that was pretty admirable. Yeah, 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 it was. And I I know. I liked him right off. I I liked him right away. Yeah. uh, He was a really hardworking guy. Right. And, uh, you know, Don was more of a, I'm going to delegate this out to everybody around and and go party. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, he, he kind of looked like, um, didn't look like a partier. He kind of looked like um, just, you know, the magic band. That's what he looked like. He looked like that's all he did was he sleep and breathe that band. But um, him and Frank always had a funny relationship. It was a love-hate type thing. <laughs> it was mostly uh, Don being jealous of Frank because Frank was, you know, really yeah. way more popular. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Don would make fun of him and say things, you know, at rehearsals about him and sure. stuff. Uh, but, but at the same time, Frank, I think, genuinely tried to be a friend to Don. He seemed to really love Don because of his, his uh, uniqueness and his creativity that was just constantly bubbling out of the ground. Okay. And uh, Frank wanted to give him a chance, so I yeah. think that was... You know, that that was how that relationship, because, you know, when after Trout Mass was done, Don complained about this and that, and said, you know, he put him on the same label as Alice Cooper and, sure. and the GTOs and uh, Wild Man Fisher. Yeah, the bizarre and label. And he felt yeah. that, yeah, yeah. and he, he felt like the band was above that. Right. I, the, the thing that I really didn't understand about Frank, and that it, it's <laughs> really... It just puzzles me to death is why Frank would spend all that money promoting or, or you know, recording Wild Man Fisher and the GTOs and then give us six hours in the studio to do <laughs> all the basic tracks of a double album. <laughs> the name of the song, you ready up there? The name of the song is Merry Go Come on, let's merry go, merry go, merry 
That didn't make you know, sense. That didn't make sense. It it didn't make sense to me at all because no. he'd heard the music. He'd heard some of the music. He didn't really actually yeah, hear yeah. that much. He wasn't around that much. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. That does make sense, though. Why would he give Fisher all that time? I mean, that was just, uh, that you know, that was, that was just pretty much, that was just something to uh, feed his... Uh, Ego, I think, Zappy just wanted everybody to say, "Hey, look what I can do!" You, you know, um, yeah, that was that was. Well, he had a, a lot of control over it too. Yeah, yeah you know, he yeah, had yeah. complete control over the music of Wild Man Fisher. Yeah, and I, I, I'm pretty sure he, he must have had a lot of control over the GTO's music. Too. Oh yeah, 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 he did. I think he because wrote it all they, or something. But um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, they didn't know anything about music. No, no, no. And I know, and I know, Wild Man Fisher thought that Zappa did it to. Uh, steal his publishing and he later found out that uh he didn't you know fisher kept all his own publishing and uh he threw a tantrum in frank's house and he threw something nearly hit uh i guess moon moon when she was a baby and that's when frank frank said to him you got to get out of here you can't come back you know um yeah he yeah. was he was pretty uncontrolled yeah 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 I met him a couple of times, and I, I thought this guy could go off at any second. He's like a loaded gun. He wow. at me. Wow. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I know he threw something and he nearly hit the baby. But um, the, uh, that would be, that would be the end for me if somebody had done that to my kid. Yeah, well, that's what happened. Frank told him, "You got to get out of here." You know, nice knowing you. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was it. Yeah. Um, so then you took over the Magic Band, and you did uh, four albums with them. You're working on the fifth now. Gosh, I, I've lost count. Yeah, you did Back to the Front, 21st Century Mirror Man, performing the music of uh, the Captain, and um, right. the Magic Band plays uh, the music of Captain Beefheart in London. Um, right. so, yeah, great albums. And, and that, there, was, there was an Oxford, uh, live at Oxford. Too. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, the music of Captain Beefheart that came out in uh, 2011, I believe. Um, they're all great, great yeah, albums. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, in fact... Over the course of the years, um, I think if you listen to them, I mean, obviously the captain well, wasn't involved, but um, the band itself got tighter and, and I think better than when you were out originally. You know, it was, yeah, yeah I don't know if it's, you know, uh, modern uh, technology, whatever the heck it is, but these albums sound a heck of a lot better than the original recordings. And um, whoever's out there listening, check them out. You could find them um, just about anywhere, um, you know, Spotify, whatever. And if anybody wanted to purchase these, um, John, where can they find them? Oh, I wouldn't have that information. I oh, have okay. to look it up. Okay, you're not going. You, um, you don't have the uh, website set for that or anything. Yeah, but I would say you know rather than. 
streaming stuff because yeah. streaming pays almost nothing to the artist. Yeah. It'd be better if they could actually buy a CD, okay. you know. Okay. They could probably find it, you know, Google it on I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure Amazon has title. it. Yeah. And also, I'm going to talk to John later when we're through with this, and I'll get all the inf- information. So if anybody wants to purchase um, the Magic Band stuff, contact me later in the week. Come to my website, and I'll let you know where to go to find the albums and stuff. And you know what? Oh, thanks for doing that. Yeah, I'm happy to. Also, um, guys, um, tis the season to help out musicians with this uh, COVID thing. Uh, musicians and performers are getting hit the worst during all of this stuff because um, you can't play. People aren't getting out there. They're not thinking about music right now when they really should be. And uh, make sure, you know, you know, if you can, help help support the artists. It's the time of... Uh, um, it's the time in our lives where artists need a lot of help too. Because look, look what these guys did for us. We grew up to to uh, you know uh, these bands. We we nurtured to them. We, you know, we, we did what we had to do. So it's time to actually get out there and help help them. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, thank um, you very much. yeah. I want to start talking about your. Um, um, you you did a set of albums with uh, guys that I really admire, and um, 
Yeah, uh, Richard Thompson, uh, Kaiser, right. uh, Fred, 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 and you. Um, how did that evolve? That was what 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 a band that was. That was like a super. That was a really that's a real super group. That <laughs> sort of was, wasn't it? Yes, uh, it was. I I didn't realize uh, I hadn't been in touch with Henry Kaiser for a while. Yeah, and um, so I, I had written him or called him or something. He says, "Oh, we got to get together." So they called me about three months later and said, "Look, uh, this guy named Richard Thompson uh, wants you know wants to do an album." I talked to him and he wants to do an album. Right. And I thought it was going to be a Richard Thompson album, and we were going to accompany him. Right. right. So when I, and I didn't know until a couple of weeks before that we were all. It was supposed to be a collaboration of all of us. So I wasn't really prepared uh, for the first one. But I thought it came off quite well anyway. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Excuse my coughing. Uh, sure. We have a lot of smoke up here. So I know, I know. You guys are, I know. With the COVID and the shitty political scene and everything else, you guys are blessed with fires. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, not fun. No, I know. Um, anyway, uh, Henry was living in uh, just north of, Near Berkeley, I, I can't remember the exact area now, but just sure, above sure. Oakland, near Berkeley, and it, it was uh, it was an old um, state gatehouse, nice big house, and we all stayed there. Uh, and Fred Frith, I had known from you know doing guitar solos and stuff. Sure. And so you know, I knew he was a great player, and he was it really seemed like a happy guy. And what I was amazed about Elliot was that he would get on the phone, he'd be talking on the phone in fluent French, and 10 minutes later he'd be talking to somebody in Germany in fluent German, yeah. and then he'd be talking to somebody in Japan in Japanese. Wow. Oh my Whoa. God. <laughs> you know, I, I was very impressed with not only uh, uh, that aspect, you know, that he knew so many languages and he traveled the world so much. Yeah, yeah. But just the fact that he could play uh, so many different instruments because he could play violin, yeah. guitar, piano, and uh, I'm missing one here, guitar. Uh -huh. <laughs> the main instrument. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, but he always wanted to play bass with me because he'd heard my drumming on trout mass and he thought, I... I could play bass with this guy really well. I know how he thinks, you know. So that was sort of how that came together. And Henry, Henry, and, and Fred had done a couple albums, and Richard was sort of the outsider guy that you know Henry had never worked with before. Right. And uh, we did a little thing at McCabe's Guitar Shop where we just showed up for a Henry uh, for a uh, Fred Frith solo concert and played a set before he played. Okay. And uh, the, the interesting thing was, was watching Fred Frith meet Richard Thompson. And the two of them grabbed a couple of acoustic guitars because there were plenty of guitars in the shop. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. And they started playing through almost their whole childhood wow. growing up playing all these songs that they both knew, you know, well, yeah. and it, that was the most fun thing for me, <laughs> was well. watching these two guys bonding over a common music background, you well. know, and they were both, you know, they're both British, of course, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that was, that was a fun moment, and uh, I remember when I first met uh, Richard, he was sitting on a stool in, in the caves, and, you know, just playing acoustic guitar. And Henry introduced me to him, and we shook hands, and he just stood there with his grin, you know, sat there with his grin on his face, holding my hand. He wouldn't let go of my hand for a long time. Uh -huh. And it was like this feeling like, you know, I finally get to meet you, and it was such an honor for me. Uh, to have that kind of a reaction. Well, I, I don't know if you know, you know, I, I talk to a lot of artists, and a lot of 
well, you guys, and I'm putting you in the same category, don't realize the impression and, and, and the legacy that you guys have left. I spoke to a guy named Tom uh, Guerra last night. I don't know if you know Tom. He, he's a writer. He, he collects vintage guitars. He writes for Vintage Guitar Magazine. He, put, he has three or four albums out. Worked with some of the greatest guys out there. He's worked with Kenny Aronson. He's worked with um, Rick Derringer, whatever. And I told him last night that I was talking to you today, and he said to me, you're full of crap. You're not talking to John. I said, I swear I am. He said, he's not going to talk to you. The guy's like a, a, the guy's like a god. He's not going to talk to you. I said, I'll, I, I told him, I'll, I'll send you the thing when I'm done. You, you'll see. I said, I'm talking to him tomorrow. You don't realize what uh, um, the caliber of respect that you have out there, and, and I really think um, it's time you did. And that's why I'm doing these stupid shows, because um, – People have to know the history. The guys who really made this thing happen, this thing called rock and roll, this thing called music, um, and that's why I'm doing it. And, and I'm so proud that you know that, that you um, accepted my invitation to do the show with me. But what I like well, to thank you. yeah, what I like to do now, and I hope I don't um, embarrass you at all, is I want to play a um, well. I'll let it later. But I have a, a solo drum thing that you did at the um, Askenaz Music and Dance Community Center. Remember doing that? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was, uh, it was a while ago. I have a drum solo you did there that was incredible. And I'm going to uh, play it. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna edit it in later. So when I send the, you a copy of this, you'll hear it. But I have the whole show there. It was.
coming back Your love for me has got to be real For you to know just how I feel I said love for real and not fade away Love for real and not fade away It's gonna be You're gonna give your love to me I'm gonna love you night and day And you know my love will not fade away You know my love will not fade away And you know my love will not fade away Not fade away Not fade away John French. The show went on for hours, and it was, um, you guys did a lot of Rolling Stone covers. You did, um, um, yeah, a little, yeah. I couldn't believe it. We were playing Played With Fire. Yeah, you did Play With Fire. We didn't even rehearse it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you did some great stuff. You, you did Love Has Made a Fool of You, Ico, Ico. It was a great, great set. And um, Oh, yeah, I sang that, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You did, you did. Um, I forgot uh, about that, yeah, old yeah. Dr. John. Yeah, 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 you did Surfing USA. You did some great <laughs> some great covers. You really did. When, oh, and then you did some Richard Thompson songs. You When the Spell is Broken. And, um, you know, you did stuff like Peppermint Rock, Love Sick Blues, March of the Cosmetic Surgeons. That was a great oh, tune. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was a great we tune. We nip and tuck and we nip and tuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a great, 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 great. Do you want to hear it? Uh, I have it, actually. Okay, I have okay, okay. Then, I, then I'm just going to edit all the stuff. I'm going to edit the stuff in later so we keep talking. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Um, you know, when when I told you I'm a collector and and I'm a, and I'm a fan, I really am. I have such obscure stuff that that you that you wound up on, and um, I'm really really uh, you know really excited and happy that we're doing this together. And I want to do another one with you in a couple of weeks if you feel comfortable enough. But let's get let's keep talking now. So um, do you have the uh, do you have the original Lagrange that was done in uh, Saryushka? No, that was, that was done in. Uh, uh, in Russian? No. That's a funny one. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's on the crazy backwards alphabet now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look for that later. Let me see what I have. But um, so that, that four man band was incredible. Uh, and is there any um, any future plans to yeah. any, anything with those guys again? Even you know just over uh, you know the internet. Yeah, we've or something. all kind of gone our you're talking about French for the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I always uh, laughed at the acronym FFKT. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <sounds>. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know it was. Um, but, yeah. No, we've we've all kind of gone in separate directions. Henry and I, uh, you know, even though we're great friends and stuff, we have completely different ideas about music. He's almost totally into improvisation right and i like a structure within which there can be improvisation i yeah. like an overall structure okay now he's done he's done both i'm not saying he hasn't but uh, you yeah. know we just we kind of uh 
we went our separate ways. Okay. You know, like two streams that separated. Sure. Yeah, um, but... And uh, Fred got really busy. He was trying to think of the guy he played with for so long. Uh, the Japanese. He had a Japanese... Uh... Okay, I, I'm losing it. I'd, I'd, I'd have to think about that for a while. This is sure. why I don't like to do live interviews. That's okay. I can look it up. Yeah, we'll find it. <laughs> but he was, he was playing with this guy... In be- he started playing with this guy after we did the first Prince Rip Kaiser Thompson album. Uh-huh. And when we did the second one, it was really odd because I couldn't seem to lock with him on the, on the bass and drums. Okay. It was like, he, you know, and Henry, Henry even mentioned, he said, it's like he's playing to the drummer in John Zorn. That's yeah, John. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know. Okay. Uh and like I told you, I don't listen to music, so I don't know. About. I think I did listen to something by John Zorn once. Yeah, he's out there. But uh, I, I sort of remain, you know, away from music because sure. I like that saying. Uh, one of the things I agree with that Don said, if you want to be a different fish, you have to jump out of the school. Right, 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 right. And um, I'm not the guy. And, you know, I think there should be people who listen to all kinds of music uh, who are musicologists. But I, I don't think that's my job. I think yeah. my job is to be the different fish. Okay. You know? Yeah, I mean, he also was in that band, uh, Hemi Cow. Oh, well, uh, somebody sent me, I, I think Hen- Henry sent me three or four of those albums. And I love them. Yeah, yeah, I did too. And there was another group, too, that, that he was in for a while. Uh, Camel? They did this thing called A Wheel Within a Wheel. Oh, okay, uh, okay, okay. He did some work with Camel, I think, too. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's not the, that's not the band. But no, no. This, there was some. Um, there was one piece on there which was just so amazing, like the wheel within the wheel kind of okay. thing. And it just had this great stuff going on in it. I was always more too. You know, Derek Bailey was uh, Henry Kaiser's guitar improv hero. Okay. But I, I was more interested in this other guy who was more like <clears throat> Fred's influence in guitar improvisation because he was more rhythmic. And, uh-huh. You know, and that appealed to me because yeah, sure. it, was, it was something I could understand more. Right, right, right. You know, yeah, I um, could relate to it. More. Yeah, and you notice how much um, rhythm is uh, taking over um, the better music pieces now? It's getting more rhythmic than, um, like, the, um, uh, the pocket, the bass, and the drums are becoming the uh, uh, center point, which... Um, yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, MIDI coming in, because people are starting to realize how rhythms work together, you know, right, electronic right. music because of that. Yeah, yeah. Who are some of your uh, influences? When I was younger? Yeah, even now. Well, like I, like I said, I don't listen to much music. No, so, okay, so in the old uh, days, who, who... But John Coltrane. Okay, you know, yeah. Uh, I, uh, but if I start at the beginning, I'd have to say people like Roy Haynes, Buddy Rich. Sure. But a big, uh, the big guy that got me into music was a guy named Sandy Nelson. Oh, who, yeah, who sure. Did, uh, drum solo stuff. You yeah, know, King yeah. Beat was right. like a big hit. He was one of the few, you know, drummers that ever had a hit song from drum solos. Right, you know, right. Just, and they, he had, like, Dwayne Eddy guitar company. Yeah, yeah. He was, um, the, he was the drummer, I think, on the Dick Clark show, wasn't he? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, he was in the Teddy Bears, the Hollywood Argyles. He was, really? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I know he did studio work. Yeah, he yeah, he did. Studio work. Yeah, yeah, he definitely... But, you know, like, I, even him, I only have one of his albums. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I grew up poor, so I couldn't afford a big record collection. I had guys <laughs> walls filled with records, and I just go, oh my God, yeah. that must have cost a fortune. Yeah, I'll tell you something interesting about uh, Nelson. He actually went to school with Jan and Dean. <coughs> oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he recorded, you know, you know, he started working, and he did that whole thing with them. But yeah, he was a really, really had several uh, solo uh, hits. He really did. He was a big, um, 
you know, he was he was uh, really really influential in, in the instrumental part of rock. But um, right, yeah. So um, a guy that used to work with him, uh-huh. Elliot Ingburn. Yeah, he wound up as Zappa. Winged Eel Finger. Yeah. Mingling worked with yeah. Danny Nelson in the early days. Yeah, he went to Zappa, then he went to you guys, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. Wow, that's pretty cool. And yeah, he didn't last yeah. long with Frank. He did that first album, I think, uh, Freak Out. All right. Yeah, so... Um, Elliot was really, you know, I, I really could never understand why he was... Don wanted him in the Magic Band, because he was really not that kind of a guitarist at all. Uh-huh. He, d- he didn't fit. In my head, I, don't, I couldn't understand why Don did it. But, uh, when, uh, for instance, the uh, film, did you ever see that little promotional film? Yes. You know, yep. in Bel Air, it's Strumbo. And, yep. You know, yep. Uh, well, that was totally Elliot Engber. Okay. He put that whole thing together, had the whole concept, and I listened to him describe it to Don one night. At Don's little house in Woodland Hills, yeah, completely from beginning to end, every detail, and then uh, it was filmed later. So I think, I think Don sort of liked him because the, uh, he was sort of the hip guy. Okay. Yeah, and um, wow, because I know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he didn't get along with with a Frank, and I know Frank got rid of him relatively quick. That he was a tough guy to oh. deal with, or whatever. It was that's the rumor out there anyway, and. Um, so, um, when you put the Magic Band back together again, who was in the band with you? The very first band, well, you know, I started out with the idea of getting the Trout Mask guys together. Okay. And, uh, and in the beginning, Bill Harkerod was on. Okay. And Mark Boston was in. And, and uh, Jeff Cotton didn't want to do it, so I got Danny Wally, uh-huh. who kind of has... A similar feel to me to Jeff. I mean, he's more, more in that category, you know. Whereas uh, Bill is more the technical player. Right. Um, Denny and Jeff were more feeling players, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Denny, Denny joined. So it it wound up being uh, after the business thing went south for a year, uh-huh. and then came back together. Bill decided he didn't want to do it. Okay. And I, I don't really blame him. I wish I hadn't done it sometimes. Right. But um, so I got Gary Lucas because Gary Lucas is a very good technician, and uh, he's sort of on the same level as uh, Zudhorn, although I'd say that Zud, you know, knows more technically about guitar now than, okay. than Gary. But, but anyway, the band... Wound up being Gary, uh, Denny, Mark, and I. Okay. And uh, when I decided to sing, I thought, well, let's get Robert Williams. Well, there was a lot of problems with that, with a couple of the guys who had worked with him. And uh, uh, But I said, well, let's give it a try and see how it works. Well, it wound up being great for the shows, but not working out too well personality-wise. Okay, then it happens. And you know what I think a lot of it is? I I, I think a lot of it with anybody who worked with Don had issues. And and, uh, because Don was uh, a bully and hard to get along with, and he loved to put people down, and he wanted his own way, and so on and so on. Um, All of these issues came to play in and the Magic Band in different ways. Yeah, okay. cause it affected everybody different ways. So there was a lot of conflict. Right. And right. because I was the kind of, you know, designated leader, the guy who pulled it all together, yeah. I sort of became the target of some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which wasn't fun. It was sort of like, a, you know, uh, it, it was sort of like everybody had put a stencil of, of Don up in front of me and thrown darts. At okay, it, you know? okay. So, and, and of course, I had my own issues with Don also because, sure. I mean, you know, after all, the guy once pushed me down, you know, the stairs and told me to get out. Right. Uh, he was, uh, he could be quite cruel. 
Yeah. I, so, we, you I, know, all of those issues, it was a miracle that we actually yeah. got anything accomplished, I, but we did. I, I mean, I read your book, and um, he, he really was a madman. He kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of like mind control things and, and, and um, you know, sleep deprivation and, and uh, gang warfare pretty much. It really was must have been a terror working in that in a situation like that, especially when yeah, you, and especially I was a naive as a kid who walked into that. Yeah, as a young kid, it must have been like, you know, terrifying. Yeah, I was just barely eighteen when I joined the band. Yeah, 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 and so. uh, phew, yeah, I, I, um, you know, I, I kind of feel for you guys. I, I never knew. I lost a lot of respect to him actually after uh, finding out some of those stories. Um, how, uh, yeah, well, my my intent wasn't to do that. But no, I know. My intent was, was uh, basically to tell the truth. You know? Right, right. And, uh, you know, one guy who I always kind of admired as an actor, Billy Bob Thornton. Sure. Um, I got to meet him uh, because of uh, Gail Zappa uh, when he was filming, in, I don't know, the mid, you know, maybe uh, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, when Gail was still alive, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but but it, he was filming a movie called Faster. Uh-huh. And uh, he was doing a, a driving scene, and when he drove up in the car, and the, the scene was done, he looked out and he saw me and recognized me and rolled down the window and said, I just read your book twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And... So we did, just started discussing that after we got back to his, uh, you know, yeah. uh, makeup trailer or dressing trailer or whatever. And uh, he said, I didn't feel like you were putting down Don at all. I thought you were just trying to tell the story the way it should have been told. Right, yeah. And that's what I try to do because, I mean, years, I've got, uh, you know, collections of scraps of interviews with Don where he was just saying outrageously misleading things and right. creating this myth for himself and the truth of the matter is is that he was a larger than life figure already but he tried to make himself even larger than larger than life you know what i mean yeah yeah and, and took credit you know saying he wrote drop this replica in eight and a half hours which is totally yeah, nonsense yeah, yeah. Yep. and that he took untrained musicians you know taught them how to play basically and that was you know, all of us had been in bands. Making, in fact, we made more money in the bands when we were in high school than we did working with him. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Because he didn't want to. He really didn't want to go out and perform. He right. wasn't a worker. That was a big difference between him and Frank. Frank was always on the road. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. And he was involved in every aspect. You know, he was involved in the. Uh, he was involved in the recording. He was involved in the. In the mixing, he was involved in the editing yeah. and in the artwork and every aspect, even the stage choreography of the band. Right. You know, and the arrangements were amazing. Some of the stuff. Yes. It was yes. very entertaining. He knew how to how to reach an audience. And Don didn't understand any of that stuff, any of the mechanics. Right. And um, he, he said, and a lot of the stuff that you he... know, people said, um, oh, "Why don't you play what people would like?" And he says. Because this is what they're going to like, right? You know, yeah. And he was like, he'd get very adamant about that. I didn't mean to um, interrupt you there, but I no, no, it's okay. I was going to say that he he took a lot of uh, of the music that you guys wrote and you know took it as his. Well, I can't say that he took did that too much. I mean, like for instance, Candy Corn. Mm-hmm. Uh, the basic idea of candy corn, I started playing on guitar one night. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, that's a cool riff. And and I said, yeah, it reminds me of uh, candy corn because it's of the shape of it. Sure. Of the shape of the riff. And he started singing candy corn. And that's how that came about. Oh, wow. Uh, but, you know, those kind of things... Uh, uh, yeah, he did take credit for a lot of things that he do. Right. And um, he could have given the band more credit than he did. I think he was just so threatened by anybody getting credit for anything. Uh-huh. Uh, 
That's amazing, yep, I mean, too. Pardon? Uh, that's such a shame, too, because, I mean, he was the um, focal point of that band. People knew it was his band, you know, and just to feel threatened by everybody else is... But you know what? It happens a lot. Uh, you know, it does happen a lot. Um, yeah, he was very insecure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the Talking Heads. Same same thing. David Byrne got all the um, uh, credit. And if you read the books by the other guys, um, you know, a lot of the stuff came from them, and he just kind of absorbed it and ran with it and, and took the credit. And, huh. yeah, so, um, you know, it happens a lot, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I Fre- heard Fre- that, uh, Fre- David Byrne got a lot of his ideas from uh, African yeah, but that was um, Chris Franz and Tina Weymouth, um, the bass player and drummer. They brought that to the band, you know, and um, they were living in uh, Jamaica. They brought a lot of the reggae influences, the Calypso stuff, back to the band. And they used to um, rehearse in their uh, loft, and um, they would just throw stuff onto a tape recorder, and he would go home with it and, you know, write a song and take it, take it from there. And, you know, he would take all the credit. But, um, you know, Frank Zappa used to do that, too. I spoke to a lot of the Zappa guys. You know, they would do a riff, and he would, you know, take it as his. So, you know, it happens. Yeah, I remember one story where, I guess, uh, Don was writing out a lot of, um, transcribing a lot of Frank's music from recorded live shows. Yeah. And and Frank said, um, well, you didn't put the solo in. And he said, well, that's, that's my improvised solo. And uh, Frank said, well, yeah, but it was done on a Frank Zappa stage. Yeah, so yeah, that Frank kind Zappa. of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, that's BS. Yeah. That's yeah. no good. Um, you, know, you know the Fillmore album, um, um, Live at the Fillmore, The Mothers? You know, if, right. if, yeah, anyway, Lonesome Electric Turkey, which is Don Preston, uh, he did a whole big solo, and it came out, you know, and Zappa named it Lonesome Electric Turkey, and he took the uh, writing credit, you know. And uh, wow. it, it was a Don Preston solo, you know, just that kind of stuff. And I guess it happens a lot. And, um, you know, I guess it's a trade-off if you want to work with, uh, you know, with these guys who think they're uh, gods. You have to kind of pay, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's right, but it happens. Um, so anyway. No, it's, it definitely isn't right. Because, no. Uh, you know, as you know, probably know, on the very first, uh, on the very first pr- printing, of Trapmas Replica, they didn't even put my name on it as the drummer. I know. Much less give me any credit for all the arranging and transcribing yep. and all that. Yep. What was, yeah, I know. What was, what was that about? Why, why did that go down like that? I think, you know, Mark said it best. He said he was threatened by how much you had to do with the, the involvement of that album, and, and it threatened him. So he, he couldn't give me any credit because he was afraid that people would start paying more attention to you than to him. Is that crazy? You know? yeah. It is crazy. And and the odd thing is, is at the time I just kind of shrugged it off and, because I wasn't surprised, frankly, after being around him for almost three years right. that he would do that. I wasn't surprised. But but the uh, the thing is that I didn't realize is how much it hurt me. Uh, later on, because not receiving that credit. Sure. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, well, he must have not had much to do with it. They didn't even put his name on the album. Yeah, yeah. Plus, um, the arranging and stuff. Uh, there should be uh, royalty for that too, right? There should have been, but uh, I don't even think Don made that much in royalties off that. The only thing I ever made royalties off of was Safest Milk. Really? Yeah, and that was. Uh, they couldn't find me for a long time because you know how musicians move around. Sure. You know, we're like nomads. Where in the fuck is he? We need to give him this money. But I finally did get caught up with them thanks to Don Van Vliet's estate, uh, the Van Vliet estate's manager, Frank uh, Mike Kappas. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. He actually notified me that uh, Sony was holding funds for me, and I thought, well, they had bought up Safe as Milk, so they, they paid me everything that they owed me. Oh, cool. And that, that was the only contract that we ever signed as a band. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And the Safe as Milk, uh, Ry Cooter was on that too, right? Ry 
Cooter had a lot to do with the uh, musical arrangement of that. Yeah. There's another guy that, you know, didn't really get credit for what he did. He finished that album. Uh-huh. It was a lot of uh, ideas and stuff, and he actually put it together. And Richard Perry was very patiently working with Don, who didn't even know where he was going to sing. Yeah. On, uh, especially on Abba Sabba. He had no idea what he was going to sing on Abba Sabba. He had written all the music, didn't know what he was going to sing on it. Wow. Because he never rehearsed with the band. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and, you know, people don't realize that was Richard Perry's first uh, production album, right? That was, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. he, uh, you know, he had been trained. He had gone through production school. He was... He was <coughs> there goes the smoke again. Yeah. Um, he, he was uh, fresh out of production school, and basically back then it was uh, mono four-track is what they taught you. You know, four-track studio, mono mix. So he was very bewildered by the eight-track at Sunset Sound Studios, right. where we actually recorded the very first song, which is Sure Enough, and Yes, I Do. Yeah. And and moved everything to RCA to a four-track studio because he felt more comfortable there. So it was like a real downgrade in technology and uh, really hampered the sound of it. I, I was very disappointed in the sound of the album overall. Yeah, yeah. And that album was, um, I mean, it was... It was hidden for a long time. It didn't come out when it was supposed to. What, Safest Milk? Yeah. No, it, it was released. Uh, was it released initially? I thought, I thought it was held back because they didn't know what to do with it. No, that was uh, that was that was a later album. Oh, okay. Safest Milk was actually, uh, came out in, uh, I think, 67. May, April or May of 67. Yeah, 67. And we were supposed to play the Monterey Pop Festival in the week before we went to Mount Tomo Pius and Don was having anxiety attacks. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, he thought he was having a heart attack and I think this was an offshoot of, you know, taking a lot of acid but uh-huh. also having uh, lost his father a couple of years before. Right. His, his father died of a heart attack and he became kind of a hype hypochondriac, I think because of LSD and his imagination, his super imagination, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure the acid so, didn't help. I'm sure the acid didn't help. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember one day, you know, I had just gotten in the band, I mean, maybe three weeks into the band, and I go over to his house, and, he's, and he's, he comes to the door, and he goes, man, I can't rehearse today, man. Huh. His eyes are all staring and wide, and I said, why? And he says, because I'm seeing angels. Oh, wow. They're, they're all around me. They're, they're all around me, and he's looking around him. Oh. I'm going, oh, wow. shit. <laughs> you know, what I get myself into. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, he, uh... And then, you know, I, I went there. He was really extremely afraid of death. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Afraid of, you know... Uh, Anyway, right down the street from him was a friend of mine who was also a drummer uh, and the same name, John. His, his name was John Parr. And so I went down to his house, walked down to see if he was home, and he was. And so we were playing around on the drums and stuff. And then a few days later, uh, while I was not at my house, John came over to my house to see me, which was very unusual because... He was the cool guy, and I was sort of the, you know, the kid that hung out with, with the cool guy. Okay. Sometimes. And anyway, he came over to my house, and, and my mother told me the next day, because I wasn't there, and I found out that he uh, took his own life then. Oof. So that was, uh, you know, and when I found out... And I, I went out and told Don about it. He says, man, don't go to the funeral and don't think about it. And, you know, he kept trying to control me and not yeah. let me just grieve, yeah. you know, and feel bad that I'd lost my friend. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, and that was, I, I think, part of the manifestation of him being so afraid. When he went to his father's funeral, it just freaked yeah. him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could do it to you, you know, it, it can. And that... 
Yeah, and that anxiety, those anxiety attacks and all that neuroses was going on all the way through the recording session of Safest Mail for rehearsals, right. recording all of it. Yeah, yeah. And that's John, feel my heart. Does it seem like it's beating really fast? You know. <laughs> wow, so you had to be a doctor too, besides a drummer. Yeah. And I got so tired of it one day, I said, yeah. well... I think you're probably going to have a stroke, Don. <laughs> <laughs> nice knowing I, you. I nice can't knowing help you. myself. It's what? And I said, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No, man. Why would you say that to me? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, that's pretty weird. But he, um, yeah, he was definitely, a, you know, a cruel guy. He wasn't the nicest man, you know. You know, he definitely was. He, there was really room room for improvement. Um, but what a master. Yeah, right. I can really truthfully say that as far as ungrateful people go, go, he would win the prize in my experience. Yeah. All the people I've met in my life, he was the most ungrateful person I've ever known. People would do things for him all the time. Yeah. yeah. And he just never, never appreciated it. He never remembered anything anybody did for him. Well. And it, it was as though we owed him. Yeah. And I think it's a result of poor parenting. Yeah, it could be. But you know what? You get to a certain age and you let that go and you learn how to, you know, what, what's right and what's most wrong. Most people did. Yeah, most, <laughs> most people did, you know. Did. I know, you know, everybody everybody comes from a crazy childhood. One way or another, your parents screw you up. I don't care who you are. And, and I guess once you hit... They can't help it. Yeah, they can't. Yeah, they, yeah, I'm sure I screwed up my kids. But... um. You know, once you get to a certain age, you say, you know what, that didn't work for my parents. It's not going to work for me. And you kind of let it go, you know. But, yeah, so, yeah, some people don't, and I think that's where you get the problems. Plus, another thing, too, is I found out a lot of um, artists who made it big at a young age never really had the time to mature and learn about the uh, downside of life. And and, and when when you do run across it, when they did finally, you know, somebody said no to them, they kind of took it harder than they had to. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. Well, he was, uh, uh, in Don's case, he was an only child. Yeah. And uh, he was very naive about a lot of things. Right. Uh, he didn't have get good interaction with people. Uh-huh. And I could not believe how many times I saw him lie to people. And think, Why is he lying right. about something that's this, Unimportant. It's not like important stuff, sure. but he just lie all the time. And uh, I was playing in a jazz club in the 80s, and this woman came up to me, a fairly attractive woman, came walking up to me and uh, said, somebody told me that you used to play with Captain Beefheart. And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah. I used to date him. And I said, really? And I, I wish I would have gotten her name because I would have loved to have interviewed her for my book sure. you know and uh, anyway she said yeah when I was going out with him he uh, he was going to a shrink because he was a pathological liar oh wow and I thought well th- that explains a lot yeah <laughs> you know? yeah no it really does I, uh, I, I actually know somebody who was um, diagnosed as being a pathological liar and they can't help it they just can't yeah. help it nothing uh, and they believe their lies but then you have all this, you know, beautiful stuff coming out of it. I mean, yeah. the poetry and, uh, and his imagination was... Yeah, and later on, his, know, his artwork, he did some great artwork. Yeah. But, you know, as far as his lyrics, just getting into his lyrics, you know, yeah. break, breaks my heart to see the highway cross the hills. It's yeah. like this little lines, and, you know, he was, he was interested in nature. He wanted to see us preserving the planet. Yeah. Um, and he was very concerned about that even back in the early days. I mean, he, he, and even a song That like, was the part of him that made me overlook, you know, it gave me the grace to overlook the bad things. Right. You know, I mean, even a song like Dachau Cow Blues, nobody was, nobody was talking about uh, the Holocaust, and he was, you know, back during the, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, during the 60s, you know, there was no reason to 
but he kind of put it out there, you know, hey, you know, these people are, abu- you know, a stupid song like Dark Cow Blues. There was no no need for it back then. There's a need for it now, but there wasn't a need for it back then, you know? Well, unfortunately, there was a need for it back then is why things are so screwed up now. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, that song, uh, I mean, it probably should have been called Auschwitz Blues because it was more about Auschwitz. Yeah. After I studied, I, went, I took a class in the Holocaust, and, and I, I don't know, I think I was in my 30s, but I just wanted to right. learn about this. Right, right. And, and uh, the guy was a World War II, a Jewish man who was a Jewish professor who was a World War II veteran. So, you know, he knew about firsthand, and I took this class, and I, I was, uh, you know, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Uh, but, yeah. But... That, yeah, him making, him caring about these things, uh, people would come up to me in later years. I, in fact, one of the people that played in the Magic Band for a while said, man, I never would have put up with that guy. And I finally got to the point to where I knew what to say back, and I just said, well, of course not, because you weren't strong enough. Yeah, well... Because that's, you know, the people who work with Don, every one of those people, I have to credit with having unusual amount of strength and tolerance to deal with it. Especially like, uh, you know, Alex, uh, myself included, you know, I'll pat myself on the back for a second. Sue Dornrello, really, you know, Bill Harcroad. Um, Jeff, um, Tepper, you know, became Morris Tepper. Right. Eric Drew Feldman. Um, all the guys that worked work with Don closely, they had to be to have the grace within them to overlook his flaws. But by, I'll tell you, by the time after 74, when Don, you know, sort of lost everything and tried to go commercial and yeah. didn't work, he was a lot more humble and kind. Okay. He was more appreciative, and he had learned a few things. So those guys really didn't get it. We got, uh, you know, the Trout Mass Band probably got the worst treatment of any group. Yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those stories. was brutal. Yeah, those sto- yeah, yeah, he was brutal. Those stories that um, came out, you know, the four, you know, four guys against one, that kind of thing that he, he kind of orchestrated. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, he did that a lot, and yeah. he was never the target, of, uh, obviously. Yeah, obviously. He was the guy yes, yes. Yeah. All we wanted to do was learn the music, because there was really a lot of work to do. And uh, I, I think we could learn it in half the time if he had, you know, wanted to have all these talks and go through, you know, yeah. it was like yeah. brainwashing sessions almost. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounded like, brainwashing. And uh, sleep, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, food, um, just, and you don't, um, you know, how, how does somebody, how does a band um, um, survive under those circumstances? You guys did it, and um, you put out some great work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't like Drop Mass that much, I like to lick my cows off. Right. But you wouldn't have had a lick my cows if you had a drum mask. You know, it was like an evolution. Every album sort of was uh, a stair step from the last one. Yeah, yeah, it was. They and bring off the uh, I mean, trout, platform. Yeah, tr- trout mask was the uh, foundation for uh, most of them, you know? Um, I, I mean, Bat Chain Puller is a brilliant album. Um, um, Spotlight Kid is a brilliant album. I mean, they all are. They, they all have their moments, and, um, they, you know, um, Trout Mask was the foundation for all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. Although he did kind of go backwards with, uh, you know, he was trying to be more mainstream when he did The Spotlight Kid, and I think he succeeded in some ways. Yeah. But I think, you know, he lost a lot of people because they were like, well, why is he going backwards? They thought he was going backwards. Well, um, yeah, then he got he got back into that. Uh, yeah, he did a couple of commercial pieces. Uh, yeah, um, 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 what was the uh, 
Well, I loved I loved the uh, version of um, um, "My Head Is My Only Home" that the Tubes did. Did you ever hear that? No, I've never heard that version. Okay, yeah, they I, they, they I did a great version of that, and um, but but you know they then he did um, the the stuff he did with Templeman, "Too Much Time on My Hands" and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that that, that you know that could have uh, crossed over. I think if it was um, promoted correctly. That song was a line that my father said, actually. Really? My father and mother were separated, and my, my dad was telling me he wanted to get back to, with her because he had too much time to be without love. Oh, wow. And I, I said that line to Don, and he went, man! <laughs> <You know? laughs> and grabbed his pad and started writing. And I wish you would have heard the first version that he did of that. He did it during the Safest Milk rehearsals. Oh, really? On Laurel Canyon, yeah, and 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 you know, it just it kind of wound up on a shelf for years, and they pulled it out. But okay. He did this uh, this ballad. It was like this really epic ballad about this guy, you know, searching out this woman and you know going to a different city to find her and looking for her, you know because he had too much time to be without love. Oh wow. And it pretty much had the same uh, bridge, yeah. But the the verses were totally different. Oh wow! Yeah, I would love to hear that. Really? Wow! Yeah, um, I, I, and they recorded it too. They recorded it on a tape, and I, I I'd give anything to hear that tape because yeah. I just I was in awe because they stayed up all night doing it. Yeah. And they said, "Listen to this, John," and, and played it for me, and he sang it. With Alex playing guitar, and and I was just blown away wow. by how good it was. Way better than the song yeah. on Clear Spot. Although Ted Templeman really took the band and did the right thing with it. Uh huh. He did. Uh, he, in spite of Don, I, I, there were a lot of conflicts with yeah. Don. Don yeah. didn't want to do this or that. He didn't want inter, any reverb on anything. And Don said, Don, we're going to have some. Yeah. Because um, it, it helps. Sure. You know, it helps give it a, a more of a, I don't know, acceptable sound. Yeah, it gives it a little heart and soul. Um, yeah. You guys played my father's place, the club I was telling you about, in 1977. I don't know if you were in the band. No, I wasn't. Okay. Was time. Yeah, okay. That was the Shiny Beast group, probably. Yeah, okay. Could have been. Um,. Uh, your father's place, what was it called? Yeah, it was called My Father's Place. Oh, that's the name of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I don't know, it's your father's no, place. No, 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 my father had nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 that was uh, just, that was the name of the club. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that was in uh, Long Island. Um, okay, so your um, solo stuff is... Um, there's some really, really great things. Oh, solo drumbo is one of my favorites. That um, if anybody out there, yeah, Henry Kaiser, Henry Kaiser had a lot to do with that. I yeah. been invited to go play for the uh, some London collective, London musicians collective, uh-huh. and it was experimental music, and so they had me play like 45 minutes of drum solos, and BBC recorded it and broadcast it. And they gave me a tape of it, so I sent it to Kaiser, and he said, you've got to do an album. You should do an album with drum solos right now while you're in the shape you're in to do it. Right. So that's how that came about. Really? Very, very interesting stuff. Um, it's any, any drummers out there, any, in fact, any, any fan of uh, John's and, uh, and the Magic Band, you ought to check that out if, you, if you've never heard it before. Um, some grease, some crazy, crazy, great stuff on that album. And the last true studio album you did as a solo act was, um, as a solo, was City of uh, Refuge? Yeah. Yeah, and that's another great yeah. piece. If you guys... Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to be playing all that stuff. I'm going to be um, putting it into the uh, cast so that you'll be able to hear part of it, guys. But um, check it out. I mean, go out and buy these uh, CDs while you can. They're only going to get harder and harder to find and... Um, you know, do it now when, when it really matters. Um, Crazy Backwards Alphabet, another great piece, and, and um, the Live, Love, Larf, and Loaf. 
uh, uh, your solo stuff's incredible. And then there's always Mallard, right? Well, I wasn't actually on there, but, but I did uh, I did write a couple of pieces for the Great of Pain. Uh-huh.
that was uh, that was uh, Sam Sam Galvin sang, and then Artie I think played, played on the first one, and they got some other drummer to play on the second. So episode. you didn't do any playing on those at all? No. Okay, just writing. No, okay. I I kind of felt like it was uh, it was being too rushed, and and the guys hadn't really, you know, we never really settled into what we were. Right. As a group. We didn't have an identity. And they were rushing to find one, and, I, and bringing in all these other songwriters with lyrics that I didn't even like. So okay. I just kind of, you know, separated myself from it. Okay. Okay, well, that's uh, understandable. So um, we've been at this for almost ninety minutes now, and um, okay. what do you um, what do you see music turning into once this pandemic is over? Anything interesting, or do you think? Um, we're going to be licking our wounds for a long time. Man, I, I don't know. Is this pandemic ever going to be over? Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> scary, isn't it? It's, it's Well, it, it isn't that scary to me. I mean, I I, I think that uh, it's been overblown. I, you know, I, I think that uh, when you have a 99.6% recovery rate in, in, as the average... That it's kind of silly to shut down the economy, and, and a lot of people have just lost their businesses entirely. Oh yeah, musicians are, yep. you know, are desperate for anything, yep. any way they can make some money. Yep. And and it's it's just it's killing everything, you know. It really is. Um, I think there was a wasn't there a uh, flu epidemic during Woodstock? During Woodstock. Don't remember yeah, that. There's some kind of epidemic going on. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, whoever heard of shutting down a country? I, I think what you have to do is you have to say, here are the risks. If you're older, if you have asthma, if you do this and this, and lay it out for people, but give them the freedom to decide. Well, you can't do that because you're being selfish to other people. Some people won't care. Right. And somebody might die because you know. It, it uh, it's a little that gets a little crazy. Yeah, it does. I, I, ne- I never imagined or never dreamed that we'd have this kind of situation. No, no. What was it supposed to be? Fourteen days to flatten the curve. Yeah, fourteen days. Yeah. <laughs> it's been over six months. Now. Yeah, it's been six months, and 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 and, and, and we're and we're looking at educational system. Yeah, I, I have um, uh, two grandkids living with me. Uh, two little guys and um, you know a ten year old and a seven year old and uh, they're being schooled in the house now they can't even go back to school yet right well my wife's a uh, fair educator so she's she works with special ed kids and she you know she's been working on a computer every day doing zoom classes and yeah. this, but now they're going to start bringing the special ed kids back oh really okay and and she said it's only the special ed kids said, why, you know, yeah. now the other, uh, but uh, special ed kids, their parents like to get them out of the house for a few hours because they require so much, Yeah, you know, well, I mean, I've gone in her class and visited a couple of times, so I couldn't believe it, I was drained right. after, you know, an hour of being there. Yeah, yeah, I know, I understand, and, um, you know, uh, my, my, my two are healthy kids, and they drain you. You know, just imagine what special ed kids can do. Just you know, just it's just a whole different level of uh, neediness, pretty much, right? It is. Yeah, it yeah. is. And um, and it takes a great deal of patience and understanding. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, and they're and, not all the same. <laughs> no, no, and they're not. No kids are the same. And, and you know, that always kind of, um, um, I mean, not always, just recently. Why would they send kids back to school? Adults can't stay six feet apart. You know how how are these kids going to do it? That's that's what scared the crap out of me. And um, you know, um, it's hard keeping these kids on focus now. They can't sit behind the screen, you know, six seven hours a day, alone. It's one thing if there's kids around you buzzing around. Uh, there's, there's there's other things to to keep your mind occupied. I'm having a hard time keeping these kids sitting behind computers all day. I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely not fun. So you've got them there right now. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge. 
Yeah, yeah, you thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's very good. You're probably really helping your uh, yeah. daughter or son or whoever's kids they are. Yeah, yeah, these are my son's kids. And, uh, yeah, we were definitely uh, doing what we can. In fact, um, I, I'm talking to my kids' doctors this week, you know, my grandkids' doctors, to see if there's anything, um, um, you know, psychologically we can do to get them prepped. Just to keep them, you know, on, on 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 schedule and things, because running out of ideas how to keep them interested, and and then super glue on their asses isn't working anymore, you know. <laughs> um, so you know, it's definitely a challenge, but um, you know, we'll figure it out. Sure. And um, yeah. so anyway, uh, so we're, we're getting to the end of this thing. Will you do this again with me one day? Now that you've done it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to mention a couple of things where I'm, I'm going to be releasing, you know, I'll probably do crowdfunder kind of things to do this. Good. But I'm going to be releasing a 2015 CD of a live Magic Man stuff. Um, and I'm also going to release the 2017 Farewell Show, which will be 24 pieces. Oh. And eight of those are with horns and backup singers and so on. So... And I've really worked hard on this. this okay. Has been like a six month. This has been my COVID nineteen project. You know, okay. Because I couldn't do anything else, so I just worked on this, and uh, it's come out pretty well. So that's kind of what I'll be focusing on. Plus, in the future, I want to do. Um, I want to do some drum so uh, drum videos. I'm just explaining my drumming on you know some of the major pieces on Trout Mask and sure. so on. So that's just, you know, to wrap it up, that's what I'm going to be doing. Probably a Patreon account to finance that. Okay, and um, we'll see what happens. And you'll keep me posted so I can talk about it and you'll come back on and talk about that when we're ready? Sure. Man, it was uh, it was such a pleasure speaking to you today. And to be honest with you, I was, I was a little afraid when we started out. <laughs> I, 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 be afraid. Be yeah, very afraid. I know, I know, because uh, um, I think your bark is worse than your bite. People are, people are, kept telling me, don't, don't mess with John. He's going to rip you apart. But I mean, you were, you were a beautiful guest. I enjoyed are this. You kidding? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you wow. can, you, you're a scary cat. <laughs> well, I, I. Uh I had no idea. Well, you were a pleasure dealing with it today, and I'm so happy we got we did this. And I really would like to do more with you. In fact, would you be open to doing a roundtable with some of the old mothers? Uh, Think about it, and I'll talk to you during well, the week. Maybe later on. Yeah. You know, maybe about no sooner than a month from now. No, I'm not talking about this week. Yeah, down the road. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. It'd cool. be kind of funny. Yeah, it would be. I think it'd be great, uh, you know, just um, sharing stories. It would be. It okay. It would be fun. Cool. Okay. Okay, my well, friend. I'm open to it. Perfect. I'll talk to them, too. And listen, stay safe, please. All right. I will, and you, too. Yeah, and happy, bir ha happy birthday. And I'm going to give you a call during the week offline just to say hi again, and um, I'll send you all the copies of the audios, and we'll, we'll just, you know, we'll figure out what we're doing. Yeah. Do you want me to uh, send you some stuff to play over the air? Yes. Okay. I, I'll send you a couple of things. I offered to do that, and you didn't seem interested. No, I did seem interested. You, <laughs> you, let it, you dropped the ball on this one, not me. I've been hounding you for months, haven't I? Uh, well, I was in the middle of mixing. And That's what you kept telling me. Deal. You kept telling me you're yeah. mixing stuff, and you let me know when you're done, and you never let me know. Yeah. And I kept pushing because... Um, well, I just got done. I, I know. I know. I know. So we'll do it now. In fact, if you get them so, off to me, I'll edit them into this piece before I put it up as a podcast. Okay, very good. Okay? All right, I'm going to let you go. Okay, my friend, and I'll send you all the info, and um, I'm, I'm waiting for the new music. All right. Okay, Thank, thanks, John. Be good. Okay. Happy birthday.
Not Your Mother's Radio is listener funded. If you wish to assist and help keep the station active, funds can be sent via PayPal to Elliot. Is. Not. Your. Mother. At. Gmail.com. Remember, there is only one L and one T in Elliot. Thank you for your assistance. It is appreciated. This has been a Not Your Mother's Radio production.